my name is Mbia Kedamini. I will be discussing uh, some aspects of uh, economic freedom, especially as it relates to translating economic freedom into policy, like some of my thoughts around that, some of the ideas I've thought about them. This, this basically comes from the Economic Freedom of the World by Fraser Institute. This is an index released every year. And uh, basically since about 2008 to 2009, South Africa has been on a downward, down, downward spiral in this index. The ranking that South Africa has on the index has declined uh, significantly. Uh, I think the, the, the year that South Africa peaked at was around 2003. And from there, it has been going downwards from there. But you will see in the presentation, so this uh, this is just a presentation showing like some of the new info from this uh, from this year's economic freedom of the world index, which would be 2020. So from the 2020 economic freedom of the world index, uh, this is a presentation which I have previously given at um, at other places before, and so I hope you enjoy it. So we can start by asking what is economic freedom, and maybe sort of separate the question into two parts. Uh, on one hand, you have the benefits, uh, you, you have the definition itself and it tells you what economic freedom is and you can decide if, 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 you, if you like that or if you value that. On the other hand, you have the, on the, on the other hand, you have the, 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 the actual benefits. So if you look at uh, economic freedom and human progress, for example, we see here that uh, the countries which which have the which have the freest economies tend to do the best. Let me just move this thing for your convenience. Let me just move something. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so, uh, let's just yeah. Uh, no, that should thankfully, hopefully, be better. So if you look at uh, uh, economic freedom and income per capita, for example. You see the which we, we um, you see that the, the freest countries in terms of quartile. So there are four quartiles uh, going from the least free countries, the bottom 25 25 percent least free countries, to the top 25 percent freest countries. And if you just look at the difference between those two, those two is quite great. I mean, it's more than um, 39 thousand dollars on average in terms of income per capita between the freest and least free country. And so already there yeah, just something that we all care about in terms of everyone having a decent income to feed their families, we already see that the, the difference that economic freedom makes. A similar, uh, not, not, maybe not as dramatic, but a similar trend in terms of uh, life expectancy. But it's, anyway, it's, it's, it's quite dramatic because if you look at the age difference, you can live up to uh, 15 years longer in the freest countries. So that's, this, this just speaks to the benefits, uh, I mean, First of all, you'll get the benefits in terms of economic freedom itself, but then you'll also, uh, you, 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 which means the freedom to be prosperous and so on, but you'll also get other benefits, which is the ability to perhaps uh, spend money on healthcare and things like that and get the best doctors and develop the best doctors in the country and so on. Uh, similar story with economic freedom and infant mortality rates. Uh, the freest countries have the least uh, mortality rates. The difference is 4.99 uh, per per thousand live beds compared to 39.38 per thousand live beds in 2018. So it tells you a story on its own as well. Uh, poverty rates uh, here. I think this is a, a perhaps a more interesting graph because as you can see, uh, in terms of the the least free countries. Uh, like it, it, the, the least free countries have the, the mo most people under the poverty line. Uh, if you just look in terms of the, um, uh, the like I the different poverty lines, one point nine dollars, three point two dollars a day, five point five dollars a day. So if you look at those three different poverty lines, you see that uh, the, the, the poorest, uh, the, the least free countries do the uh, do 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 the, do the least well on 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 all three poverty lines. So if you want to have, if you want to minimize, po if you want to reduce the levels of poverty, you you look for the freest countries, and these are the, the most economic, uh, and these are the countries which have the least amount of poverty by any poverty line, whether it's uh, one point nine dollars or five point five dollars. So we we know now why uh, uh, economic 
freedom is important in terms of this index at least in terms of the some of the things it correlates with so but how do we translate this into policy and then there's more to say in terms of in the sense that economic freedom correlates positively with many other societal variables we would like to improve so it's not just that uh, it correlates with the things that we've shown you life expenses and so on it correlates with many other variables that we would all like to improve uh, basically anything that human beings care about improving tends out to or, or in almost every case be related to economic freedom as well so in terms of the societal big things that everyone is always calling for it turns out that the best way to elevate a lot of these things is through giving people more freedom and it makes sense in a way i mean if you think about it once you give people the freedom like the, the ability to make their own choices to choose which profession they go into to choose which uh, uh, which industry they go into as entrepreneurs and so on uh, which businesses to start how to start their businesses how to use their property give them free use of their property and um, make sure they don't don't debase their money and uh, remove as much regulation as possible so individuals can actually start business and not spend all of their time uh, and money complying with regulations that have no connection with the job that they introduce the problem the entrepreneur is trying to solve so if you just remove all of those things and just have the individual be free then it stands to reason that the individual then can focus on their actual problem instead of for solving government created artificial problems caused by regulation taxes and so on they can actually solve real problems faced by society and by society meaning that uh, uh, problems faced by other individuals whether it's schooling the lack of income and so on so it's, it should stand to reason that by simply uh, allowing that then you that's what you will get so but if you look at the definition of economic freedom the Fraser Institute uh, this, uh, is the one that publishes the economic freedom of the world index and that definition is the, in, uh, is, the is of the index is that the index measures the degree to which the policies and institutions of the countries are supportive of economic freedom the cornerstones of economic freedom are personal choice, voluntary exchange, freedom to enter markets and compete, and security of the person and privately owned property. So uh, it is divided into five areas. So we've seen now what the, the benefits are. But if you look at the definition, so there's the size of government variables. The smaller the size of government, it's it, it, the um, uh, if, if government spends doesn't uh, spend a, a, a lot, if a government uh, restricts itself spending only the the minimum, it doesn't tax too much, it doesn't spend too much, then the government is freer than the government that spends more and taxes more. So basically, that's how it works. In terms of legal system and property rights, here we look at the adequacy of the legal protections for property and as well for. Uh, dispute resolution in, in this resolution and the enforcement of contracts so things all of those eight things are included there which are all related legal system property rights contracts enforceability of contracts and so on so all of those things are important for any economy and they are, in fact you would say this uh, unlike area one area one is something that um, is sort of like a, an, a, an economic problem like the, the bigger the government it is uh, yes, there is property rights involved in the sense that the more government taxes you, the more your property it takes. But it's the argument tends to be more economic. Whereas in property two, these are the absolute essential minimum institutions that every country needs. This uh, under the legal system and property rights, every country needs secure property rights to get investors to have a successful economy. It needs um, fair enforcement of contracts and impartial judiciary and so on. So those are important things. Sound money, obviously, um, if you, no matter what, what value you produce, if you can no, not capture that value and store it in money, in money that is uh, that maintains its value, then there is uh, there is no point in producing anything really. So sound money is incredibly important, and it's one of the biggest violations of economic freedom in the world today. Across the world, every entire every country in the world uh, has a variant of a fiat currency. So every country in the world basically um, allows governments to print um, receipts and give them to people as money to the people and those receipts the government can print as many can print as many of these receipts or tokens that they want because their money is essentially digital now so government can print as many of these tokens as it wants and that's the money that people use so that's um 
it's, a, it's an extremely inflationary set of circumstances and i think almost every uh, fiat currency since fiat currency became a standard in, in 1971 i think almost all of them have lost more than 90 percent of their value so even the best ones so south africa has lost much more because it has been on um, it has uh, it has declined faster than some and then freedom to trade internationally the removal of things like exchange controls which is the free uh, it's all about the free movement of capital across borders not putting too many uh, 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 restrictions and costs or, or friction in, 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 in the flow of capital and the flow of goods and people across borders so it's all related the flow of capital the flow of people the flow of goods and services so e all of these things are interconnected if you don't have the flow of capital then you you don't uh, if you don't have the flow of capital you uh, but then it means that you cannot you cannot build businesses across borders if you can't build businesses across borders there might be less of a need to hire people across borders and if you can't hire people across borders well then it also uh, affects uh, the, the flow the flow of goods because it affects the uh, the, the, am the amount of goods the productivity that you can engage and if you can't hire people across borders can't move capital across borders it ultimately affects the the, pr the productivity like if you if, if if you can't get the best in capital the best in people uh, then you you you, you can you can't produce the best goods it should it should be an, an obvious thing to people so re don't restrict the, the free, uh, free market movements don't try to pick with any winners and losers if governments are competent at picking which we, we, which people should be allowed to cross borders uh, they, they they would be competent uh, to pick as well which people should be successful in the economy we know governments can't do that so they can't pick which people should be able to move across the border for economic reasons now governments have a responsibility uh, to protect citizens against criminals and that's a different thing it should not be seen as part of the restrictions that the general restrictions that government sometimes or the arbitrary restrictions that government implements against uh, immigrants and then the last area and in my opinion the most uh, significant area of harm in south africa today is regulation this includes all of the rules the conditions the licenses uh, things like the labor laws um, regulation on businesses the compliance environmental regulation all of those uh, myriad of things that uh, companies have to spend billions and billions of on complying with government rules that have n no nothing to do with uh, serving the consumer, uh, meeting a need, solving a problem in the market, all of those things. So the, 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 these are the five areas, the five components of economic freedom, as you will. And so this is the, the basis of the entire index. So if you look at the averages, the average economic freedom rating from 2018, it has, it, has mainly, it has mainly increased, it is impressive. I mean, it does seem that over time more and more countries seem to um, uh, realize the importance of economic freedom. Uh, you, you see something interesting, around 2007, they, 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 the trend sort of peaked in 2007 around the global financial crisis. Let me excuse you. So the trend sort of peaks around 2007 and then it declines in economic freedom and i still remember around that time there was a lot of talk about uh, how the market had failed and we must get back to uh, a more central planning and uh, i've seen that idea lasted for precisely about three years and then the the the, the increase uh, the, 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 the the interrupted increase in economic freedom went on as uh, as before i think this is purely because countries have seen the benefits of economic freedom or, or although it has gone it, the increase has gone on at a slower rate it must be admitted that it had been going on before so it's no longer as fast the increase as it was before between 2000 and 2007 so it's, uh, it's still increasing but it's a slower increase and i think the main reason for that is simply that uh, if you look at like the, the, empiri the empirical evidence is in i mean there is uh, i think it's no longer in doubt only to the most um, stubborn people like you see still in doubt that economic freedom is uh, produces all of these benefits yeah so that's uh <coughs> and uh, so that's uh and then we will look at each area one by one so you can see so we look at each area we we we've, we've discussed now what is economic freedom um, and then we've looked at the definition as well as the some of the benefits 
and then we'll go around there are five areas size of government legal system and property rights sound money freedom to trade internationally and regulation we'll go through each area in turn and see some of how south africa has done uh, in the past and now in the present so uh, south african government has grown over time i don't need to tell anyone who has been paying attention for the past 10 or 11 years that over the past 10 or 11 years south africa's government has just grown seemingly without limits and driven mainly by the increase in uh, wages and salaries of civil servants in as much as uh, uh, bailouts have grown i mean i think the the main thing that has really grown is uh, has been the wages of civil servants so that's that's the main problem that the government has uh, in as much as um, uh, the other things are a problem like i mean and i mean we'll talk about other areas where your problem is and i think regulation is a bigger problem but size of government is is one of the more important government problems as well i think it's uh, it really is something that has to be attended to and the main problem there is the unions so you have to deal with the, the public sector unions who keep expecting an increase and the, and the collective bargaining that goes on in the in the in the public sector that doesn't allow government to give increases selectively like choosing like you know uh, the best employees for increases and then those who don't do so well maybe don't give them an increase and things like that so if you do, if you're more and more meritocrat in the private service in the in the civil service then i think you would have less of these problems but you know in general like smaller government is better than bigger government and south africa certainly proves that so the size of government rating these are just some quick charts i did um, and it shows that uh, South Africa peaks around 1995, so the government, uh, uh, the, 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 it must be said that the National Party did a lot to reduce the size of government between 1975 and 1995. And uh, unfortunately, the government, the size of government has grown since 1995, and uh, it has only around 2000 and. Uh, uh, 17 that, uh, that, that we start to see a, a slight improvement and there are specific reasons like there's a there's a reason for it it's actually not a good thing like this is this is not actually a real thing what happened here uh, okay let me see okay. so what, what what actually happened here is that um, because so the, it's it's uh, it's because of the way the efw is defined when south africa changed its uh it's the the margin the top marginal tax rate for income tax in south africa to a higher rate um uh, to a higher top rate but then they they did this by uh they, 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 so they had basically they, 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 the the dfw couldn't account for the changes in threshold in tax so while south africa went to a higher uh, let me just check this so the top marginal tax rates went from 46% Okay, let me actually just check it I think I need this so do, 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 do. But anyway, uh, the point is uh, I, I done research into this But basically South Africa didn't improve that You just take my word for it now uh, but South Africa didn't really improve here. So stimulus spending, uh, an expensive welfare system, bailouts, wages and benefits in the civil service and corruption has been the main drivers of South Africa's growth in government. This I think goes uh, the saying. And you can see it's highlighted here. This comes from National Treasury. If you just look at social spending um, in uh, in the latest February budget, which was February of 2020, the government had budgeted for 1.15 trillion rands in social spending. Uh, this is out of a total uh, government spending of 1.95 trillion rands. So we cannot pretend that social spending is, um, is, is something that is not doesn't have any impact on the growth in the size of government in South Africa. And you can see that the biggest components, learning and culture, health, and so these are exactly the problems, social development and so on. So these are things that South Africans need to be able to talk about and actually solve because it won't just it won't be enough to keep all of these programs and uh, and just reduce the civil service or something like that. You will you will actually need to cut down on some of these programs too. And then we move on to 
legal system and property rights and uh, this is probably the key area here where we have to every country needs to perform well in there's no there's no room for mistake here and to be fair between 1990 and um, about 2000 uh, South Africa improved in this area and then it, it has been more or less uh, stagnant and EWC will likely uh, lead to a precipitous decline in this variable and so this in this area so this is something that you should continue watching as South African and the quality of the courts too are important here yeah, so we should con also continue watching that uh, a change is definitely needed in terms of um, uh, impartial courts which is a sub-component of this uh, uh, legal system and property rights area uh, the impartial courts South Africa appoints its judges through a politicized process most of the members of the judicial services commission uh, 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 political appointees and not legal professionals or academics so and so and so on and so there is a model for how to do that better in Finland for example and so South Africa has a lot to learn from uh, maybe some of these other countries then when we move to sound money uh, this is a very important variable I mean the central bank continues to debase South Africans money uh, just to give you an example, in um, in in nineteen in in between the sixties and nineteen seventy, South, South African rent was about uh, we did the calculation once. One South African rent was about fifteen grams of silver, if I if I'm not mistaken, and so fifteen grams of silver today in today's money would be okay. Actually, let me just calculate it. says 12 rands 28 rands for one gram of silver so we multiply that by 15 in today's money we just based on the price of silver it would be about 184.20 but yeah I, I i'm not sure the silver content of the old south african rent but it would be around 14 grams 15 grams i think but anyway the, to illustrate the point that uh, the money loses money loses purchasing power over time if you allow the government to basically just de debase it to without end and to print as much of it as possible there needs to be some real uh, market-based restrictions on how money, much uh, money government can print. And when it comes to returning to a commodity standard, the interesting thing is almost every country on earth now has uh, foreign reserves in both fiat currencies as well as gold. So the, the importance of this is that if the price of gold goes up uh, high enough relative to, uh, uh, to fiat, to all fiat currencies, then the, the, the foreign reserves of central banks can be de become de facto majority gold or we, we, without anything changing in terms of policy. So the markets can actually force governments to adopt a gold standard or something like it or put a Bitcoin standard. But, uh, I, I know, but, uh, no, 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 but the, the gold is uniquely positioned in the sense that only gold like, is still considered a reserve asset by the central bank. So gold like markets can force central banks to go, go back onto the gold standard simply by revaluing the, uh, the 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 balance sheet that every central bank has that uh, relative the um, the value the relative value of gold and the fiat currencies that all central banks hold which are chiefly the us dollar the euro uh, the japanese yen and so on The, the reserve countries are usually the, the reserve currencies of the world are usually the trading currencies, the most important uh, currencies used for trade. Um, so, like if you want to, like the, the, which is usually the most industrialized countries, because if you want to buy German goods, which is one of the most productive countries on earth, then you have to give them whatever currency the Germans accept. So, that's generally the principle, and the dollar has a special place because 
you know it's uh, you 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 can only buy oil with dollar and the us is uh, basically the 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 the, the world's most important economy uh, it got there through uh, for good reason but you know it stays there for not so good reasons <laughs> the freedom to trade internationally and here in south africa as well not so much to speak of it's more or less been a statement we, we haven't um I improved there was a best of improvement between 1985 and the year 2000 and since then there's been more or less stayed in the same place um, around 6.5 so uh, this is not much has changed here and then when we get to regulations uh, it's actually split into different and in, into different parts you have credit market regulations labor market regulations business regulations let me just move this credit market regulations, labor market regulations, business regulations and just the overall picture. So I wanted to give it as, my, as much detail as possible because uh, the regulation area is one of the more detailed areas in the EFW, uh, the, uh, EFW index. It has more data points and so on. So it's an important area. So if we do that, you see with credit market regulations, Uh, the, so that this is uh, a the, 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 there was an improvement between 2000 and 2005 and then a decline after that and then uh, so basically over those years between uh, around 1995 and uh, to today like there's, there's been a constant change like you know uh, vol what we call volatil volatility but then the change is more or less there hasn't been uh, the, the, there's been a slight decline from the peak but there hasn't been like a uh, since 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 the end of the big change from 1980 to 1995 there hasn't been a, any big moves uh, upwards or downwards now in terms of labor market regulation this is a uh, an area which is surprising because you would think uh, south africa would do much worse between 1995 and 2000 especially when the worst of our labor market regulations came into being but uh, yeah, and, and there seems to be uh, some improvement in the e e e going between 2012 and now. So we shall see whether it is sustained. I know that there, there were some small reforms that have been undertaken, but uh, nowhere near the magnitude of what needs to be done to uh, reduce the current unemployment rate, which is of, as of the latest numbers, tends at above 43%, which is the expanded definition now. So. Uh, but there's nowhere near the amount of reform that has been done needed to alleviate that big problem South Africa faces, the higher employment rates, especially the higher youth unemployment rates. So it's also related to business regulations. In reality, labor regulations are an instance of business regulations, but you know, if you, if you want to strictly separate labor and business, you could do that. But in, in a way, you can also see them as the same. I mean, there are good reasons for doing both. And in terms of business regulation, it's just been a uniform story of decline. Basically, since 1995, it has been it has declined, and then between 2006 and 2010, there was an improvement. And, and that this would be as Kisa, the former pro, president's uh, uh, policy. And then under the Zuma administration, just the decline, decline, and to to the point where uh, South Africa now is worse off than it was before before the end of apartheid, which is quite sad. In terms of the overall, there is uh, there was a marked improvement in terms of regulation between 1980 and 1995. But after that, uh, like other areas have more or less stayed the same. But uh, business regulation in particular has declined. That the, the economic freedom in terms of business regulation has declined pretty drastically. It means that there's been more regulation in terms of business regulation. But over, over the overall picture says there's been a, a movement, like there's been little movement, like we've more or less stayed in the same place, which is not good given the extent of where we are. And uh, business regulations are, of course, key because you, in order to get jobs, you first need a business. So uh, you, you need that key bottleneck to be removed to the business regulations in order to start getting jobs. So yeah, that has been uh, my presentation on economic freedom. I hope it has provided some uh, knowledge to you. It has been of some use to you. And I hope you enjoy it. Um, thank you.